I'm Chef AJ, the author of Unprocessed and the creator of the Ultimate Weight Loss Program. If you'd like to find out more about me, please go to www.eateatunprocessed.com. If you live in Hawaii, I will be speaking at Castle Hospital in Honolulu on Monday, February 9th at the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii in Honolulu on the 10th and on the 12th in Maui. So if you're in Hawaii or you want to go to Hawaii, please join me there. If you live in Texas or are willing to travel to Houston, I'm going to be speaking in an amazing symposium on Saturday, February 21st that our next guest is going to tell you all about. And I am delighted to have someone tonight that I know very well. He's one of my favorite plant-based doctors. He's a wonderful author and lecturer, and he's a pretty good poker player, too. One of the highlights of my, <laughs> my – and I think you pretended like you didn't know what you were doing, but you were taking everybody's money. And one of my highlights of this year's Vegetarian Summerfest, excuse me, last year's, was playing poker with our next guest, Ann Howard Lyman. My next guest is Dr. Baxter Montgomery. He received his undergraduate degree from Rice University in Houston and earned his medical degree from the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston, Texas. So he's a good old boy from Texas, stayed born, bred, and educated there, it seems like. Dr. Montgomery is the founder and president of the Houston Cardiac Association, abbreviated HCA, and the Montgomery Heart and Wellness Center, which guides clients and patients towards optimal health through nutritional excellence. In his programs and books, such as the Food Prescription for Better Health, Dr. Montgomery has used a novel food classification system that helps people reverse chronic conditions such as heart disease, hypertension, obesity, and diabetes without medications or surgeries. He has refined this process over the past 10 years with profound positive results in severely ill patients. So please welcome to the show, Dr. Baxter Montgomery. Well, thanks for having me, Chef AJ, and uh, wonderful thanks for that great introduction. And yeah. you know, I forgot all about that poker game. <laughs> <laughs> well, you came to the table like you didn't know how to play, and I, I you know, we're, we're not suckers, but you did very well. And I hope you'll be back, and you know, we can we can have a rematch. That was really, really a fun night playing poker. <laughs> You're, it you're, was fun. I enjoyed it. <laughs> you know, you're a real person. You drive a truck. You really, you know, you really are. You're down to earth, and that's one of the reasons I, I really like you. And it just seems like you're a fish out of water, though. I mean, a, a plant-based cardiologist in cattle country. I mean, how did that happen? Yeah, it's interesting. You know, um, I've been in practice for about 18 years, and you know, the Texas Medical Center, which is approximately four miles north of my. Um, my health and wellness center, which is a you know a standalone building, and and we've been there for ten years. Um, it is um, the world's largest medical center, mm. and so we've had um, you know the three uh, heart transplant centers in walking distance there. Wow, uh, they're sure. you know three major. Um, you could call them hospitals, but they're not simply hospitals. They're three major healthcare conglomerates that have, I guess you can say, headquarters there. But these uh, major hospital systems have hospitals, satellite hospitals throughout Houston, and uh, the other little minor little medical centers throughout Houston. So it's a very, very large uh, uh, medical sick care conglomerate system that we have here. And so I've been practicing the medical center for, you know, two decades practically. And, and, you know, I've seen patients, you know, that, you know, we treat with the traditional medication surgeries and the best of all medical technology. And I'm not in the sticks. I'm right in the, you know, one of the top institutions, you know, around the world. And despite all that we have to offer, these patients continue to get sicker and sicker over time. And we spend more and more money. You know, they rotate in and out of the emergency rooms and the hospitals with various complications and the like. And so I noticed this with my patients. You know, I do uh, both standard cardiac procedures. I, As an electrophysiologist, I, I used to do, you know, a very detailed electrical, heart electrical ablation procedures and and plant defibrillators and pacemakers and, and, you know, did a lot of those things for patients. But despite all of that, you know, they just got sicker and sicker over time. So I ran across the whole concept of healthcare using a natural approach. And I was, you know, experimenting with a lot of things. I experimented with vitamins and different diet plans and the like. And uh, I ran across the plant-based uh, approach. 
and found that it was by far the most effective way in helping people not only prevent disease but uh, drastically reverse a uh, disease that was in very uh, advanced states. I mean, we've had I've had patients on life support where uh, they have a peg tube, a peg feeding tube, where mm. I was able to put raw, uh, you know, super greens through the peg tube in a you know ground up liquefied state, and I was able to de- you know wean them off medications and detox them. So we've had severe situations like that. Uh, we've had, of course, patients with very advanced disease in the office who we've treated. Uh, and and to the extent that the patients follow the approach 100%, we've not had anybody not have any improvement. That, that's, that's, and, just, uh, that's, that's, that's remarkable. You, you said that you ran across the plant-based approach. Could you be a little more specific? Was it a book? Was it a documentary? Was it a colleague? What, how did you get introduced? It's, you know, it's interesting because it was a series of books. You know, as I said before, I was experimenting with different things. And I read books for, you know, Eat Right for Your Blood Type and various books with diets and so on. There was always a common denominator. You know, whether someone was selling snake oil or selling some other approach, there was always the need to eat fruits and vegetables. I mean, mm-hmm. so That's, there, yes. was never, there was never a healthy plan that excluded fruits and vegetables. So there was a meat diet where you had maybe lean meats or whatever. It was whatever, you know, dead animal flesh they recommended plus fruits and vegetables. Mm-hmm. Then I started running across, you know, recommendations of fruits and vegetables only. So then you look at the, you know, diet X, Y, and Z that has X, Y, and Z plus fruits and vegetables, then fruits and vegetables only. So there's always that common denominator. So fruits and vegetables uh, are part of every healthy nutritional regimen. I couldn't agree so, more. So then, then I started thinking, so well, wait a minute, you know, if there's data saying that, you know, this plus fruits and vegetables is good for you, and then fruits and vegetables only is good for you, then maybe fruits and vegetables only is all you need. And not only that, maybe it's the optimal uh, nutritional regimen. And um, after experimenting with a number of different nutritional plans, you know, my own cholesterol was elevated. Uh, LDL cholesterol was at 138, and I didn't want to take medications. And I had done a, a, a specific diet where you know, calorie restricted, and, you know, you lose tons of weight. But my LDL cholesterol didn't change. So one thing is that even though you can lose weight on a lot of these diets, the biochemistry of your system is not necessarily favorably affected. So that was one thing that really struck me uh, with, you know, my non-scientific, you know, look, initial non-scientific look at these diets and plant-based diets. So then I ran across uh, a number of books, and I really, to be honest, I don't remember specifically what book I read that was on, there was something on juicing and something else, but what happened was I took a raw food diet, no, excuse me, a raw food uh, preparation course. So I, I took a weekend certification class to become a raw vegan chef. There was a raw vegan chef that came to town and, and uh uh, I ran across uh, some advertisement for the class, and I went and took the class. And I met a number of people in the vegan community here in Houston. One lady named Janice Blue, who's a very big proponent of eating vegan and uh, used to host a vegan radio show. And so I, I then became connected with the vegan community here. And at the class, there were a lot of resources. And some of those resources were different books. I do remember the China study being one. Uh, and a number of other uh, books being part of that. So we became aware of um, this approach just to some extent by me experimenting, reading different books, taking this uh, vegan chef's class, and I was introduced by uh, to this uh, approach and all of this information on eating plant-based. I then did a juice feast. I did a 30-day juice feast detox on my own. Uh, with the um, guidance of uh, a well-known juice person here, John Rose, uh, who's very knowledgeable. And then he introduced me to a number of other books. And so to make a long story short, uh, I did get the China study around that time. So I read the China study around the time during the juice feast. I may have read one of Neil Bernard's books around that time. 
So it all just started to come together in my personal experience worked. And then I started trying this on, you know, some patients and again saw very remarkable results. That that's so, amazing. Yeah, so we started it, you know, on a individual basis where we would go patient by patient. I would, you know, put them on a, a natural detox diet and I'd write out recipes for salads and different things and salad dressings and what have you and they'd come back in a week and we'd see the results improve and then We'd write out some more stuff and have them come back in a week. And um, it was a step-by-step approach, and we started collecting more of these recipes. We put them in handouts, and that evolved into a booklet and the like. And uh, we started getting very good results. But it was, you know, on a one-on-one basis. It would take a long time in the office and explaining things. So to make a long story short is that, you know, we started having collecting patients with good results. Well, I remember the local news media had come to interview me on the topic of sudden death in young athletes, and and uh, she was with the local Fox News station. So while she was waiting on me to show up, someone in my office started talking to her about some of the things we did with our patients and some of the results that we had gotten, and she was uh, intrigued by it. And so after she did that interview that day, she asked me if she could come back in a couple of months and interview me about the uh, – nutritional program, the things that we did with our patients, and they wanted to focus on diabetics, and we were okay with that because we had a lot of patients with diabetes. So nevertheless, they came back and did some extensive filming. We had a couple of our patients that had great results uh, be interviewed as well, and uh, they put together a wonderful news story and aired it uh, twice uh, in a two-week period of time and then invited me to the studio to do a live interview uh, that second week, you know, after the second airing. So to make a long story short is that it, um, the uh, story was very well received. They, I think the news station got about 10,000 hits on their website on that story. They, Could people um, still see that story? Is it on your website? Because I believe I saw that piece. It, it was in Yeah, some- it's on YouTube, actually. If you uh, Google, if you go to YouTube and search Dr. Montgomery for re- reversing diabetes, you should find it, and it's um, uh, so it's on YouTube, so it can be found. But we also have a link to our website, which is MontgomeryHeart.com, and it should be found there. And it's on my Twitter, it's at Dr. B Montgomery. Mm-hmm. So it's I've tweeted on it as well. So if you follow me on Twitter, uh, you can then find that and some other stories as well. That's great. But uh, so the long story short is that it was you know it uh, received an amazing review. And that really pushed us into the next level because, you know, before we'd been working, you know, uh, almost total secrecy, just, you know, just grinding away a patient at a time here and there. And, you know, I was still doing my routine cardiology work and and so on. But then after the news story, we we were just overwhelmed with calls. I mean, I didn't have a website or anything. My book was not out and so on. And... You know, the day that I went live on the station, that uh, our phones were just uh, overwhelmed. I mean, the station's phones were overwhelmed. Our phones were overwhelmed. The story uh, was such a big hit, they had to do extended pieces on it. And then they did a chat line that next night. They also sold it to about 12 affiliates around the country, the Fox News affiliates around the country. You couldn't pay for that kind of advertising. No, 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 could not at all because <laughs> we got calls from around. That's exactly right. And then uh, so um, the F- Fox affiliate in Atlanta ran it, and apparently one of the a an viewer or someone you know recorded the story on uh, the news and put it on YouTube. And so that's how I got on YouTube. In fact, I didn't know it was on YouTube until I got a call from someone in California about our YouTube clip. <laughs> I said, what YouTube clip? <laughs> so anyway, so it, it so it got us to the point where we had all these people coming to the office saying, well, I want you to reverse my diabetes, you know. So that's when we started the boot camp. And so the boot camp was born shortly after that, and that was our uh, first um, – isolated wellness program so we uh it's a one month curriculum where you know uh subjects come uh, individuals or clients come on saturday mornings or sometimes saturday afternoons and uh, five three-hour sessions Mm. in the course of that month and and we do uh you know sort of a powerpoint uh, 
PowerPoint presentation where the concepts are of plant-based eating are explained. Um, we also cover issues such as food addiction, and there's a lot of information in terms of shopping out, eating out, and the like. <clears throat> there's always a food demonstration, lots of recipes, and associated with that is uh, a shopping, a supermarket shopping rounds that they get, <clears throat> and also there are three uh, cooking classes that are separate that come back to our restaurant uh, for the cooking classes. So over time, that developed, and that you know boot camp that started in 2008. Now, first boot camp uh, started in December. December of 2008 went through January of 2009. So you, as you know. Uh, Christmas and New Year's oh, were boy. covered in that period of time. And yeah. in our boot camp, we have them eat raw vegan. So we had about, I think, started about 22, 23 people, had about 16 complete the first one. And that one was a very accrued program. I didn't have uh, a program now has handouts and, you know, recipes and with video demos and the like. That program only uh, had just me standing in front of a group talking. There was no uh, – we did the food demos, but they'd have to write down the recipes, and oh. we changed them. There was no structure to it at all. But despite that, you know, we collected the blood work. So we collected, you know, blood sugars and inflammatory markers and, of course, you know, vital signs and blood pressure, et cetera, in addition to weight. And in the five-week period of time, that first boot camp was five weeks, uh, in that period of time, in which is a very short period of time, you look at scientific studies, uh, for about 16 subjects, we had very significant reduction in cholesterol, blood pressure, uh, and various other, you know, health parameters. And, um, you know, I had some biostatisticians analyze the numbers and calculate the statistical significance of it, and uh, it was very, very powerful. So the significance, statistical significance, was very, very strong, strongly different from baseline to uh, finish. So I was very excited about that, but largely because I knew that we were on to something because I knew that the program was going to get better. I knew that our implementation would get better over time by simply carrying the program out. And so uh, the boot camp uh, lives on even to this day, and it's going on very strong. We've added a number of other programs. We have annual membership programs. We have um, a number of um, – uh, we've uh, we started the Food Rx program, which is – uh, the food prescription plan that we've integrated into the office. So unlike the boot camp with patients pay strictly out of pocket, the Food X program is for anybody with any insurance uh, can come and get a nutritional detox. And we have a, a special design program that you come through the office and get it through the office visit. Yeah. And that, that correlates with the medical visit. So we can wean the medications and do any type of diagnostic or therapeutic things that need to be done in the office while they're getting the nutrition, which is really where it should be. The unique part about the FoodRx program is that it's one of very few programs that's structured and, and integrated within a standard medical practice. So someone with Medicare, Medicaid, Blue Cross Blue Shield or whatever can come in and say, you know, I've got high blood pressure and I want to get it under control and I'd rather not use medications and that's an option that we use. So we have that alongside of any you know, other therapy that's there. Right, because you're still, a, I mean, you still can do things like angioplasties and stents and write prescriptions. You're still a medical doctor, even though. Absolutely. We, that's, yeah. And that's the key is that I, I still work in that arena because, you know, I practice in the medical center. I have hospital privileges. I have, you know, patients I'm consulting on, I, I can, you know, I still do pacemaker, defibrillator implants, heart cats, and all of that. Uh, what I, and we also do therapeutic treatments in the office. We do external counterpulsation treatment, which is a treatment that's an alternative to bypass and angioplasty. Um, and we do a number of other therapies in the office. And again, we still prescribe medication for people that need them. Right. And we adjust the medication. Some, some patients, it takes a longer period of time for them to make the proper adjustments, and but we still that form we work with them, and uh, so it's not like they go off to a resort and come back after two or three weeks. 
uh, were there for them always. And there are a number of examples. Uh, I've had patients who I've been seeing for many, many years, and you know, I talk to them, and they, you know, have they struggle with the whole concept of doing it, and all of a sudden I say something, and we say, well, why don't you start? And they start. And after two or three weeks of doing better, they keep on going. There's one patient that comes to mind. You know, she she's done very, very well and, you know, has lost over 100 pounds. And, and she's 100% plant-based. And, okay. and, uh, it's, it's, and, you know, we're reducing medications. We have people with severe lung disease. We get them off oxygen. We have people in their 80s and 90s who have been shooting up insulin for 40 years. We get them off the insulin. It's just an amazing number of things. Yeah. Why isn't this on the front page of Time Magazine? You know, that's what I want to know. Your practice is, is so remarkable. I visited you last year when you had me at, at your fifth annual symposium. And in addition to being able to wield a scalpel, you also can wield a chef knife. And what people <laughs> don't know is when they go to your office, it's not like going to a doctor's office. Because in your office, there's a gym and there's a trainer that's work making. So you don't just tell the. This is what I love about you, Dr. Montgomery. And I wish that your practice was a model for every medical practice in the world. You go into your office, and sure, you have the machines and the, you know, all the things you'd find in a regular doctor's office, mm -hmm. but then you've got a gym because you're not just telling your patients to exercise. When you tell them, they go right next door and exercise. You're That's not right. just telling your patients to eat a plant-based diet. They go right next door, and you've got a restaurant there. It's like a one-stop right. shop. I, I, I mean, that's what's so you because there are other, there are other plant based cardiologists and I'll be having them on this program as well. But you're the only one that's got it all right there. You don't have to go anywhere else. Yeah, that's right. And this is a model. We're actually developing this model to the franchise, and we're fine tuning. We have the intent of it not being isolated uh, forever. You know, we we have the intent of optimizing everything we do and replicating it. So, you know, that's, that's an, I mean, because it has to be there. Medicine, you know, as a country, we need, uh, this approach for our healthcare. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, um, you know, it's, it's just a simple matter of necessity. It's not, it's, 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 it'd be wonderful to say, oh, this is a nice novel little thing. But when I get up and go to work every day, I, I see myself as going out on the battlefield because, you know, we this country will not be taken down by, you know, some terrorist group or you know some you know alien out of you know from Mars or whatever. Yes. We're gonna be taken down by what we're eating every day. Yeah. And it, it's a, I it's love it. Bankrupt us. I love it. I and love it. So. Yeah. You, you you know in your bio I I which you know I got from Sierra it says you use a novel food classification system that helps people reverse chronic conditions. So can you talk about what this novel food classification system is? Yeah, that's a great question. So when I started eating plant-based as I mentioned I went 100% uh I did a raw juice feast and I detox and I felt wonderful and then so then after I got off I you know just started eating strictly vegan. And I, you know, read a number of the different books, and it's, you know, eating 100% plant-based. However, you know, when I did that, I, you know, you know how it is, you know, eating plant-based, but, you know, you want to be satisfied. So, you know, there's some vegan restaurants out there, and they have fried this and fried that and sautéed this and sautéed that and oils or whatever the case is. Sure. And I noticed that, you know, when I ate that way, as well, you know, I'm not as, you know, strong as I was when I was, you know, all clean and so on. So every year I would do a raw detox, I'd do a juice feast, not cleanse, and I'd feel much greater. And then I'd come and say, okay, I need to remove some of these things that I know are bad. So I'd remove the corn chips and various other things. And so as thing, time progressed and I got more custom, I, you know, I recognized that, you know, all plant based foods are not created equal. Right. And so it's not only what you eat, but what's done to what you eat before you eat it, which is also <laughs> important. Interesting. And so that's one aspect. The other aspect is that some foods may be superfoods, and the, so how the food is, is, is cultivated or how it's grown or what, what condition did it, you know, originate from. So, you know, there's some foods that, you know, like if somebody I was uh, talking to, um, a patient or someone, and, you know, they had lived in an environment where they were eating food from the jungle. So it was all wild stuff. It wasn't cultivated. So it was some of the healthiest stuff. And then uh, some people may eat all organic. That may be another level versus conventional, whereas, you know, fertilized and all of that. So how the food is grown has some uh, aspect 
of uh, you know its quality. So we created a food classification system from zero to ten, where we classified the foods not only based on you know whether it's plant or animal, uh, but then based on what's done to the food. So we uh, there's a without getting into too many complexities here, but the gist of it is that I created a criteria that says okay. If uh, question number one is a food plant animal, is it synthetic? Is it organic? So, because you know people take vitamins which are synthetic, so that's a negative. So then the next question is, okay, how you know much processing is done to the food? Uh, and then the next question, what origin is the food? Is it is it from a wild state? Is it organically grown? Or, you know, and so on. And so you go through this series of questions about the food, and then depending on what the food is. And, and what all these the answers are that gives the food to a certain level. So, like if you start with okra and you say, okay, okra is it plant or animal? Well, it's plant. Okay, plus. They say, well, is it organic, wild? Okay, maybe it's you know wild okra. Okay, plus. Then you say, okay, well, then uh, what's done to the okra? Is it raw? Is it you it's know deep fried? Real, <laughs> deep fried. So if it's deep fried, that's maybe a double minus. So. After you've gone through the series of questions, that that okra, which could be organic or wild in its plant, but if it's battered and deep fried, it may be out there next to fried chicken or next to chicken fried right. steak because exactly. of what's done to it. So the food classification is a way that, and we give examples of foods that are in different levels. And so we talk to a patient, so okay, you need to eat at level zero to three, or zero to four B, or zero to four A, or zero to two. Uh, and so that you know other things like glycemic index. So you know from one, two, and three, they're all raw and solid. But three is high glycemic index, uh, two is low glycemic index, and two. I mean one is low glycemic index, and two is in the middle. So they're different things. So if somebody's a brittle diabetic and they're just now transitioning. They may their blood sugars may not tolerate high glycemic index foods right away. So we may keep them off level three for the time being. Let them eat fruits, but eat fruits at one and two. And then after their body is healed and they may be able to tolerate level three, then they can eat level three. So there's a variety of ways that we use it, and, and our clients and patients love it because it gives them some level of precision. It's not enough to say eat vegan because then you can find all sorts of things that are vegan. Certain candies are vegan and so on. Sure. So um, so it's, it's, there are all aspects of what you eat. And if you're using food as medicine, you need this level of precision. It's one thing to look at a population and say, well, these 10,000 people ate vegan and these 10,000 ate meat. Well, the vegan people did better than the meat, and you'll, and you'll find that positive data all the time. But when I'm sitting and staring one person in the eye, and they say my blood pressure is high, my cholesterol is high, I need to very, be very precise when I prescribe them something, if, especially if they want to use food and food alone. So would you say would it be fair to say that that everybody's at a different level depending on their their level of health? But but we could say that everything is whole food, plant based, no oil, mostly raw at the beginning. Would that be a fair assessment? Yeah, that's a fair assessment. And the thing is, uh, the oils. When I say no oil, no isolated extracted oil. But clearly, like if you have an olive oil. Uh, it should be in the context of the olive. So if you have olive oil, you should have it when you're eating the olive, not extracted olive oil. Right. So whole so, food. So, yeah. Exactly. So that's a whole food. So yes, it's a whole. So no oils that are extracted or isolated oils. And and but, but you're right. Where do you stand on you know? Because and, and here's the thing: we have about 20 questions, and I know that you could probably answer each of them for like 10 minutes but when we get into them I'm, I'm asking if you go a little bit faster so we can get to everybody's question and one sure. actually is well where do you stand on nuts and seeds like are you exactly with Ethel said no nuts yeah the thing with nuts is that I'm not no nuts you, the, when you're dealing with seeds and nuts they cannot be cooked mm -hmm. and when you look at these diets and they're low fat they're low fat because they're, they, all the foods are cooked so when you're cooking all your foods, then you need to have, I would say, not only low fat, but almost no fat, because you don't want to be cooking seeds and nuts. So uh, so I stand with them only in the sense that they shouldn't be cooked. Okay. But but do you give... You but know, seeds I, I, are better than nuts. We, right. we, we use seeds. 
seeds were better than nuts. Nuts are tricky because they're shelled. A lot of them are shelled and sometimes are steamed and sometimes are pasteurized. Mm-hmm. So oftentimes the nuts are cooked without you being without you knowing it, and so that nuts can be tricky. So when we're detoxing people, we remove all the nuts. Mm-hmm. And once they're you know experienced with eating plant based and the psychological aspects is over, then we will guide them toward good sources of nuts on a limited basis. Yeah, but it's it's not like a preponderance. It's not like a nut diet. I don't want people to think like, oh, Dr. Montgomery said I can eat nuts, so they'll sit there and down, you know, a one-pound bag. It's not that at all. Yeah. No, we say no nuts at the beginning, and then after you've uh, gotten through the whole process, then we say, okay, here's how you do nuts, and it's limited, but yeah. Limited. Yeah. Well, speaking of Dr. Esselstyn, you know, I recently got a TV show that's going to air soon called Healthy Living with Chef AJ. And my first two guests were Dr. Campbell and Dr. Esselstyn. And I asked them both, I said, well, who should I ask to be on the show? And they both said you. So that you're, they're very, they're very uh, big fans of yours. And so that was nice to hear that Dr. Campbell's book was one of the books that, you know, also um, it was on your list of, of having influenced you. So we have... Yeah, so is Esselstyn's book too. I read his book. In fact, they... I, I heard from both of them uh, around the time that uh, that um, story went out of us on Fox News. And uh, Neil Barnard, I think, was in Dallas, and he saw it on the news. And he sent the letter in the book, and then uh, uh, Campbell's uh, foundation called me. And then I talked to him, and then I got uh, contact with uh, Esselstyn. So... Yeah, it was in very short order, and they they were all very supportive, and they came to our 2009 uh, health summit, and uh, were very very supportive in helping us get get the, our program off the ground here. That's Houston. great, and I wish you so much, you know, more future, you know, all the success in the world presently and the future, because I I love what Thank you're you. doing. So I'm going to get into some of the questions. As I said, sure. we have, we've only got I'll about a half hour left. Yeah, I mean, I mean, if there's something you really need, I just want to, because people do love to have their questions asked. You know, asked. I'll give you my auctioneer. Uh, I'm not kidding. <laughs> so Carolyn wants to know, what would you say to somebody who has prediabetes who doesn't take it very seriously? If you are pre-diabetic, is your body being damaged in the same way as if you have full-blown diabetes? Well, the answer is yes. The simple story is that these diseases are beginning to cause harm before they become, you know, overtly problematic. So pre-diabetics are uh, developing coronary disease even before they get the car step of diabetic. So by the time they're diabetic, they may have advanced disease in you know other organs. So so yeah, it's a problem. And uh, you know if they're not taking it seriously, they need to. And sometimes people just have to graduate to diabetes, and sometimes they oh. graduate to heart attack and other things. Oh really boy, take it seriously. It's just too bad that that it has to be that way. You know. Yeah. Good answer. Gail wants to know how long does it take to reverse heart disease on your program? Well, really, the um, it, it's almost. The way I like to think of it is almost instantaneously reversed in the sense that heart disease and diabetes and all these other chronic illnesses are really manifestations of one disease, and the one disease is bad food. I call it bad fooditis. <laughs> so once you remove the bad food from your, from your plate and you start to eat healthy, natural food, in essence, uh, conceptually, the disease is reversed at that point in time. Now, from the standpoint of whether the heart gets stronger and the arteries open up, that depends. We've had a patient with a 95% narrowing of a proximal artery to open up to zero, went to from 95% to 0%, you know, narrowing to in about five and a half months. We see changes within days to weeks, uh, biochemically and to some extent physiologically. We have data showing significant changes in our boot camp patients who do raw vegan in about four weeks. So it varies from person to person. Uh, The more severe the ailment, the more aggressive the nutritional regimen. But generally speaking, within days to weeks, patients start to feel some improvement, and uh, and they continue to improve over time. One of the things I loved about your book, and I, I say this all the time when I speak and I quote you, is you say that the disease isn't hereditary, it's the recipes. That's right. That's right. Families pass on disease more Effectively through recipes and through genes, that's right. right. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Jimmy wants to know how your nutritional boot camp differs from Dr. Esselstyn's program, and can it be done remotely? Um, the difference, you know, there's not a lot of difference in the sense that, you know, we sit down in, in Esselstyn. I mean, I'm familiar with his classic program. I don't know too much about his current program, but I remember he just sat down with his patients and followed, you know, what they ate 
and you know lectured them and gave them information and so the the bare concept of that is is similar to what we do you know we have groups of about anywhere from 15 could be as many as 30 people in a group and it's like a classroom setting uh to some extent and we go over you know concepts uh theory and practical know-how uh there is a possibility of doing the boot camp remotely. We have a video uh, uh, boot camp that can be done remotely. We also have programs where people can fly in and do a weekend, uh, day and a half, or two days crash course, uh, either individually or small groups, and then go home and then f and follow through and then follow up with us by phone call or follow up. And that. We've done that with some individuals, and that's worked out pretty well. Oh. So we have a variety of, of programs that would work. Uh, that's great. Uh, it's people great. Far away. Yeah. Uh, Brock wants to know if you would offer a discount to Chef AJ's group for your comprehensive nutritional guide. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, I'll tell you what, I'll work, I work something out through Chef AJ, and, and we'll get a discount to you. It's I, not a problem. I love your laugh. You have, you just, that's a, you're just, you're just, a, you're just, a, I love your, your laugh. It's, you're just, it's just. A, Thank you. Sh should I tell people you're single or not? I just told them, but. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look at you. How could anyone not want this guy? This, what, so he is single, guys, and he's a Pisces. He's really sweet. Okay, so. Um, <laughs> Deb wants to know if diet and exercise can help a leaking valve. Well, the answer is yes. The thing with the leaking, it depends on what valve it is, how leaky it is, and the like. Uh, valve disease, much of the time, is sort of inflammatory-induced. You have the classic mitral valve prolapse, which is thickened, et cetera. Uh, but I tend to tell my patients a lot of times these valves, and I see, read echoes every day, and we see leaky valves all the time. So the answer is it can at least prevent pro progression and, and it may actually reverse depending on how aggressive you are with your nutritional regimen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Carolyn wants to know if diet will have any impact on mitral valve prolapse. Yeah, and this uh, mitral valve prolapse again is a we, we have this fancy medical term myxomatous degeneration of the mitral valve and all that means that the mitral valve is there's probably an autoimmune process mechanism where your body's own immune system may be attacking the mitral valve in some cases. In other cases, it may be nonspecific inflammation uh, that's causing the mitral valve to become inflamed, thickened, elongated, and then leaky. So the answer is you've got to stop that underlying process, and at the very least, the valve will not progress to a worse condition and possibly even you know, the inflammatory process may work and may help some healing, less thickening and the like. Interesting. Now, this is, a, this is an interesting question from Wendy, because she lives in Cleveland, where Dr. Esselstyn is fairly well known for his work at the, at the Cleveland Clinic, reversing heart disease. And she says, whenever she meets the cardiologist in her area, they, why do they respond with such disdain when she asks them about a whole food plant-based diet? I mean, it seems like <laughs> cardiologists don't like your work. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's uh, the, the I think the real answer to that is quite complex. I think simply is that there are a number of things that, you know, there's a lack of knowledge in, in, in the general medical community, but I think there's some, there's some inherent bias. And that's, uh, she should fly down and come to our conference because the, the president of the American College of Cardiology yeah. is going to be there. Kim Williams yes. is going to be there? Oh, my God. He's going to be there. That's yeah, he's going to be there. We got late confirmation, so that's why we didn't get him on all of our our marketing stuff, but we're going to get him out there. But long story short, he'll be here, and uh, and he's vegan, and he promotes it, and he'll be lecturing on that. That's true. And um, it, the, the point is this. Uh, my colleagues, I talk to them. They know me. They respect me. And uh, they know the results. So there are a lot of cardiologists. People are just ignorant of different things. And so it's just going to take time for them to go. And I'm, when my lecture, I'm going to talk about, you know, uh, radical breakthroughs in medicine. This, this is not the first time this type of thing is, 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 uh, has uh, happened. So uh, we'll, we'll discuss that. But it's a complex answer, but I think the issue is, ignorance and the other stories that you know you've been trained to do one thing and somebody says well it's not that complex it's as simple as eating right 
you know, that kind of takes a little wind out of your sails. Yeah, exactly. Cause, so there's a little bit of ego in there, too. You know, I wouldn't be surprised. And there's a little bit of uh, cash flow in there, too, because I think that these uh, procedures probably pay a lot better than kale, you know? Well, <laughs> maybe not uh, so much. I mean, uh, re- reimbursement has gone down by 90% yeah, since I started that's practicing. True. That's most cardiologists are actually out of business. They're, they're owned by hospitals, so a lot of them wow. are no longer their own private practice. Yeah, yeah I, was, I was being snarky, so I apologize. <laughs> think, but, you know, the few cardiologists I've met, I've said, well, why don't you, you know, consider this? And they say, oh, well, well, my patients wouldn't do it. And I said, well, have you mentioned it to them? Well, no. Well, then how do you know they wouldn't do it, you know? <laughs> because they won't mention it to them. That's why they know they won't do it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, um, they won't do it. <laughs> Shirley wanted to know if a sugar-free, oil-free, salt-free, whole food, plant-based diet could cure premature ventricular contractions. Would it help if someone got down to a low normal BMI? Well, yeah, I mean, eating healthy helps with arrhythmias. We have a number of patients with arrhythmias, uh, whether there's ventricular arrhythmias or atrial arrhythmias, and we see some benefit. Now, there's not a lot of data showing that specifically. Uh, I have uh, some anecdote, and as an electrophysiologist, I want to at least do some work on that where we look at uh, monitoring before and after uh, introduction of you know, a plant-based diet. But, but anecdotally, I do see patients with arrhythmias that we manage, and they improve when they, when they consume plant-based, clean plant-based, and then they can get worse when they come off. And so I had a patient with severe atrial fibrillation with conduction abnormalities, and he has a defibrillator I implanted years ago and his, you know, weak heart and different things. And, and, uh, we got him regulated, you know, with plant-based food. So we, you know, it, it can happen. Uh, so so what are the causes? So atrial fibrillation isn't always a result of bad eating. Is that correct? It's, well, I mean, it's part of it, all of these diseases, as far as I can tell, is a result of bad eating because things that begat atrial fibrillation form, you know, form for us part of bad eating. So, Atrial fibrillation is to some extent a complex, you know, is is related to a complex set of problems. It's, it's an arrhythmia of the upper chamber of the heart. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, so there are uh, electrical uh, uh, signals that can originate from the pulmonary veins in the left atrium that can serve as triggers of atrial fibrillation. In fact, I used to do these procedures called pulmonary vein ablation. Oh, I've heard of an ablation, yep. Yeah, yeah. So I can put two catheters. I do a transeptum, did a double transeptum, and put catheters in the pulmonary veins and and isolate those veins. And and in people with early atrial fibrillation, it worked pretty well. The longer you've had it, doesn't work as well. But then other causes of atrial fibrillation may not be due to origins in the pulmonary veins, but it can be due to scarring in the atrium. And there's a atrial arrhythmia called multifocal atrial tachycardia which has different little areas in the atria that, that initiates uh, arrhythmias. And so mm-hmm. that could be a cause. And on the EKG, it could look like atrial fibrillation, but it could be some kind of a weird, complex, or degenerated multifocal atrial tachycardia. So different th- atrial arrhythmias are there. The longest story is, the long and short is, inflammation probably underscores a lot of these versus metabolic imbalance. And these things are, are underscored by poor nutrition. Yeah, and so and so and I would say most disease is underscored by poor nutrition, wouldn't you say? Not just I mean, exactly. Yeah, that's I, exactly, and so that's why that's why our food R X program is is the foundation of how we treat most of our patients who choose to go that route, whether we're manipulating medications or not. Yeah, Shada wants to know um, if a person is following a whole food plant based S O S free that we call sugar free, oil free, salt free diet, but eats too much fruit, can that affect their triglycerides? You know, it's an interesting question. Um, it depends on their metabolic state. So, for instance, if a person's a diabetic and been diabetic for a very long time and they have severe insulin resistance, then they may not be able to tolerate uh, the fruits as well. So your tolerance of fruits has a lot to do with your body's ability to, to uh, uh, metabolize them. So, for instance, a diabetic may... Uh, uh, be on insulin, we take them off, we put them on plant-based, eat a lot of fruits, the blood sugar goes up. So maybe we have to put them on a lower glycemic index fruit initially and let the body heal. So the similar metabolic process that that, it, that doesn't allow them to metabolize the, the glucose and 
the cause of blood sugar to go up may also be related to high triglycerides as well because high triglyceride to HDL ratio is related to insulin resistance. So I wouldn't say that fruits in and of itself causes the problem. It's just that, you know, the triglycerides may be high initially uh, while the body is trying to heal and recover metabolically. And once the body heals and recovers metabolically, then they'll be able to tolerate the fruit. Wow, that's good. But that could take months to a few years. Yeah, that's good to know. Well, she's been doing it for about three years, so that's good to know that things can change if you stay with it long term. Exactly. So lots of questions on your opinion um, of salt. Is salt restriction necessary? How stringent does a person have to be? So where do you stand? About two or three questions. Where do you stand on the side of the salt? So salt, so, yeah. Alan Goldhammer and I had a nice little conversation on salt. It's so funny. We were there. I visited him at True North, and, oh. and uh, it was fascinating. And yeah. The problem was we agreed on too many things, so the only thing we can argue about is salt. And we got <laughs> down to... Well, you know, salt and celery versus salt. <laughs> so okay. it was kind of a silly little debate, but it wasn't much of anything. But the long and short is this. Salt gets a bad rap similar to sugar because most salt that people are exposed to is processed salt. So the typical table salt, the salt in foods is preserved. It's, 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 it's boiled at 2,000 degrees and, you know, bleached and talc and whatever else is done to it. So you're dealing with a different molecule. Now, if the salt is from celery or natural foods, obviously it's the best. Uh, inorganic uh, forms of salt as close as natural state like sea salt probably isn't as bad as the uh, processed table salt. So we have paid uh, subjects, if they add salt to the food, one, we say add it to the food that's already prepared. So right. if it's cooked, don't add it exactly. in the cook before cooking but after the cooking. Use a a pure natural sea salt, a pink salt, one of those, and uh, and it forces you to use less because it has a very bold taste. I mean, I've when I put salt on some of my things, I use sea salt. Uh, sometimes I accidentally over salt it, even with a very small amount, because yeah. it's such a bold taste. So you can't tolerate too much of it, and so you have to use less. So I think the salt restriction is one that I would. You have to, it's the quality of the salt more important than the amount of salt. Now, again, some people with bad hypertension may not tolerate even a smidgen of sea salt initially. Again, mm-hmm. have given time to recover and heal, and then, then they can probably tolerate. But get your salt from natural forms as much as possible. Seaweed, celery, uh, that's the best thing. And then, mm-hmm. then you can uh, maybe a little sea salt, uh, but after it's cooked. Sure. Yeah, and then if you do the sea vegetables, you'll you'll get the iodine because you won't get iodine from sea salt. Because that's right? exactly right. The sea vegetables we we promote a lot of sea vegetables with, even if you're just using wakame or kelp. We have people we do our shopping rounds. We'll open a bag of wakame, have them taste as a yeah. snack, and this kind yeah, of kelp, salt. Yeah, kelp. You know, kelp. Yeah. Whole, whole kelp is my favorite. Whole kelp. Kelp is good. Yeah, is, kelp is very good. Dulse is like, good. Yeah, in soups and in salads. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it's funny. I was going to ask you this earlier when you said one of the things you covered in your nutritional boot camp was food addiction. And I, I work with a lot of food addicts, too, and I find some of them, salt is just not really good because you give start giving them salt, and the next thing they want is sugar. Yeah, the thing is, uh, it's true. You do want sugar. Again, uh, get your sugar from a date or an apple. Yeah. Uh, and... Uh, I think you'll be better off, but but you're right. It's again, it's going to be the forms of salt and the sources of sugar. If you're eating your salt from wakame or kelp or whatever, sure. and your sugar Way from different. the apple or date, Absolutely. then it's it's going to be you know better for you. Sure. So we have a lot of questions on supplements, and I, instead of reading each question, I'll just say the different supplements that are people are asking you what you feel the value of. We have CoQ10, we have B12, we have. Uh, krill oil, E3 Live, probiotics. Uh, people are wondering how you feel about, I guess, supplements in general and those specifically. Yeah, I'm glad you gave a list because I was going to come out with a blanket on a uh, statement on supplements. But then, so here the deal on supplements. I'm not, uh, I don't think you should do vitamin supplements. Vitamin D and B12, I say it on an as needed basis. Now, a lot of my colleagues say, you know, do a multivitamin B12. And I agree, I supplement, personally I'll supplement with D or B12. I'm not outdoors a lot. I may supplement D. Uh, mushrooms, shiitake mushrooms is another good source of vitamin D, so you don't have to, you can get it in a whole food form. Yeah, you can get B12, the 
you know, you can put the powder in things. I have the powder. Yeah, the the shiitake mushroom powder. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I didn't know about the powder. I have to look it up. But anyway, the um, the uh, B12 uh, theoretically, you know, we live in a sanitized environment, so I'm always washing my hands. Well, and so our our flora, body flora, perhaps even gut flora, are not optimized. The bacteria makes the B12. So. You know, given that, you know, we're not out working in the garden and the farm and all that stuff, perhaps like we're used to, so we may not have the optimal bacterial flora, so we may need to supplement B12 from time to time. I still recommend checking your B12 levels, and if they're in normal range, then, you know, or high normal range, then don't supplement. Or stuff. So it's really supplement on an as-needed basis, and try to do a lot of fermented vegetables, you know, yeah. sauerkraut or kimchi, uh, and then some probiotics may help enhance, you know, B12 production in your gut flora and that type of thing. E3 Live is a superfood, so even though it says supplement on the bottle, it's really uh, we classify as a level zero, uh, and it's a high, and it's, it's harvested under wild nature, so it's not a supplement like some kind of vitamin because it's not sure. processed. So a multivitamin, or any of these extracted nutrients, when you extract a nutrient from its natural source. I say stay away from that. So vitamin supplements and all that, stay away from them, exception of B12, vitamin D on occasion as needed. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you really shouldn't, other than those two vitamin supplements, you shouldn't have to supplement any vitamin uh, whatsoever. These different oils, again, extracted oils, I think you should eat uh, oils in the form of whole foods, such as you know, chia sure. seeds and flax seeds and the like. So I would stay away from supplements by and large. Yep. This question from Kristen, uh, actually, I was going to ask anyway, which is, what are the best markers in routine blood work that predict cardiovascular health and reassure us that we're heart attack proof? So yeah. we like to see the numbers. Well, you know, your standard lipid profile, you can also do particle sizes. Uh, so you look at subparticle proteins, look at, you know, inflammatory markers like C-reactive protein, PLAT2. Uh, those are good markers to look at. Uh, to determine, you know, if you uh, are heart attack proof. But I, I, I uh, in some of my lectures, I tell my uh, listeners that, you know, really the the, the diagnostic and therapeutic uh, uh, technology of the 21st century is the meal plate, your breakfast, lunch, and dinner plate. Because if you you take that plate, and if you don't have any heart disease or cancer or diabetes food on it. Then you can pretty much assure yourself that you're not going to, you know, be proof yeah. of, uh, you know, right. safe from those diseases. Right. So, th- so we don't have to worry about being under 150 for total cholesterol or under 80 for LDL or, or. You know, it depends. And I've treated some patients who have genetic uh, lipid type of lipidemia. That was a question. What do you suggest for those with resistant high cholesterol, even on a perfect diet? Yeah. First of all, make sure the diet is truly perfect. So, because when people walk in and tell me that, then I ask them detailed questions. It's not truly perfect. So, make <laughs> sure it's truly perfect. What I have done is I've put people on juice feasts and aggressive detoxes to kind of break through the ice. And sometimes, even a water fasting period could also help. And that you know you can go to True North for that. But uh, and so sometimes you have to tweak and make the diet more aggressive. And and a raw juice feast for 30, 60 days would be something that can really, you know, bring you down. But long story short, I've treated patients with very high, you know, cholesterol. And one, a, a, one patient, had, you know, she was real young, had a cholesterol of over 400. She was, you know, thin and, and still thin, and we got it down to probably low 200s, a little less than 200 total cholesterol. But So she might go down less than 150. So the question is, is she heart attack proof? And I think it goes back to the meal plate. Um, she doesn't tolerate statins and the like, <clears throat> and so as long as she's eating a clean, plant-based diet, I think she's pretty safe, and we monitor, and she's doing great. But so, I don't let the numbers be the end-all, be-all. Sure, that makes sense. Yeah. So this is a, a, I like this question from Judy. Is do your recommendations for people who have heart disease differ from those for people that are simply trying to prevent it? Uh, no. Great. Not, I, generally I, speaking, no. Yeah, I, that, I thought that would be the answer, and I'm, I'm glad I really like that answer. Yeah, it may be levels of degrees. For somebody with advanced heart disease, 
They may be on a more aggressive regimen than somebody who's just trying to prevent it, but by and large, it's the same recommendation. Yeah, I find that true because, I, I mean, I eat the same way now as I ate when I was trying to lose weight. I mean, I, you know, you don't change the diet with the disease. You just eat, like you say, in a healthful manner, and you kind of hit everything, you know? That's right. That's right. Yeah. So, okay, this is an interesting question because I was going to ask you about stress, but I like the way that Lisa wrote it because Lisa said, what is the difference in beneficial health results between trying to eat a mostly SOS-free diet, feeling stress-free, and the measurable stress of trying to be perfect on this diet? So, But in the context of stress in general, that that's not good for your heart either, is it? Well, I mean, stress is not good, but, you know, stress is a funny thing because people come in and say they're stressful, and so I say, okay, fine. But um, a lot of it has to do with, you know, what's inside of you. So I can give you a medication, for instance. Maybe I can give you some psychotropic drug, and it can cause you to become depressed. I mean, maybe it's an antidepressant. And then you take the drug, you become more depressed and commit suicide. In fact, we know that side effects of certain depression. Yes, heard of that. Or you can take anxiolytics and become more anxious. Or you can take an antiarrhythmic and have arrhythmia. So a lot of these drugs can have effects. So what does that mean? Well, there's there's a biochemical aspect of these conditions. So there's a biochemical aspect of depression, biochemical aspect of anxiety, and so on. So what's a biochemical imbalance? Well, again, it goes back to the ultimate biochemical intervention which is going to be with food so you know people can be on a certain diet and there's certain chemicals you know what's the uh side effects of yellow dye number you know 50 or red dye number 39 uh well some of these things can have adverse effect on the biochemical uh as you know biochemistry of the brain mm-hmm. and so you can get anxiety with certain food dyes and coloring and so there are a lot of bad biochemistry in the things that we're putting in our system We've seen patients and well, clients in our boot camp come in back and say, you know, my road rage is gone and my mood swings are are, are no longer mm. there and I'm a happier person. I have a sense of euphoria. And so all of this is brain biochemistry. So uh, the stress is starts from the inside out. Mm. And uh, I think it has a lot to do with what's, what's being put in the body. Other thing is that, uh, you know, if you're getting out in the fresh air and exercising, uh, your endorphin levels go up. I remember the first case personally when I had, I was, I was major depressed, major depressed in my uh, third year of medical school. And what happened, wow. I was always exercising. And then when I got in my third year and I was you know, on the wards and we're rounding and working all day and I having to study all the time and I just didn't feel like I had time to exercise, I stopped. And then for several months, I, my endorphins level, you know, bottomed out and I felt lousy. So, I, I bet. you know, there's a lot of biochemistry, and it happens to do what you're putting in your system and, and you know, what you're exposing your system to. We have, we have about uh, two more questions. Sharon wants to know your opinion on the role of exercise, how much and what intensity is optimal if one is following this, this diet. So you've heard of different care, Romney care, Obamacare. Here's Montgomery care. <laughs> Eat like a rabbit. Eat like a rabbit and train like an athlete. So it does go hand in hand with nutrition, but you have to nourish the body first. I love that. You we, that has to be a bumper sticker or a T-shirt. I love it. Eat like yeah. a rabbit, train like an athlete. I, yeah, I, that's Montgomery Care. I do half of that already, but that is terrific. That, yeah. is, that is, I love it. That that is you. You have some really good ones. You know that. Thank you very much. You're you're very clever that way. So what about things like love and relationships, and does that affect your heart? You know, you hear about people dying from a broken heart. You know, you hear things where people have been married a long time, they, their spouse dies, they were healthy, and they die, that they say of a broken heart. Or how about things like having pets? Does, does any of this enhance our cardiovascular health or well-being? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, yeah, people need people are the luckiest people in the world. I think the thing is that you you – our relationships with the people around us certainly is very important and, and necessary. And then you know, when we lose loved ones, then that does take a, a toll. You have to adjust, and and um, uh, you have to cope. You have to find other people that uh, you know you can interact with. Uh, but but it is a challenge. I just thought of something because I sometimes am dyslexic, and I didn't want to accidentally say eat like an athlete and <laughs> train like a rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, sorry. Oh, Mitch, I don't want to say it backwards. So the last question is your thoughts on caffeine, chocolate, and alcohol, yay or nay? Well, it depends on what form it's in. Caffeine in the form of coffee probably isn't so good for you. 
Uh, herbal teas, natural herbal teas, whether they have caffeine or not, are probably okay. Uh -huh. Chocolate, uh, we use um, the raw chocolate, the cacao nibs or cacao powder, uh -huh. and I think it's fine that way. And what about alcohol? Oh, alcohol. You know, theoretically, alcohol should be good, but most alcohols that I know about are, are they're fermented, but they have a lot of preservatives in them. If you're going to have alcohol, you know, a wine from an organically grown grapes that's vegan friendly, it's probably okay. But yeah. even a lot of times it has preservatives, so it's not an optimal food uh, in most cases. But uh, a, a vegan friendly wine from organically grown grapes is probably your best bet. But that's not eating like a rabbit, because I don't know any rabbits that drink wine. That's exactly right. Yeah, I don't either. <laughs> you know, kombucha, kombucha is a nice fermented beverage, and technically it's, it's like a wine. But yeah. So that would be a good alternative. I drink kombucha, and it has a little buzz to it and so yeah. on. Yeah. Well, can you believe how fast this hour has flown? It's been such a pleasure talking to you. But before I let you go, please once again tell people that are listening what your website is, maybe the name of your book, and, of course, about your upcoming summit. Yes, so the website, MontgomeryHeart.com, MontgomeryHeart.com, and uh, on the right upper corner on the website, you'll see a link to the Health Summit. I invite all of your attendees to come, and um, we will work on the discount for the guides, but the um, Health Summit is on February 21st. It's a Saturday uh, from, 7, uh, from 8 o'clock to 3.30 in the afternoon. And uh, we're going to have uh, um, Michael Greger will be there. Terrific. Dave Mason will be there. Doug Lau will be there. Chef AJ will be there. Wow. Chef Yvette will be there. Great lineup. I'll be there. Dr. Kim Williams, president of the American College of Cardiology, will be there. And it, we're just going to have a great time. Lots yeah. of information is going to be at the Kingdom Builder Center. But, but do come. If you know someone in the Houston area, encourage them to come. It's a great program. And uh, I think you get a lot out of it. The book is The Food Prescription for Better Health. It's on my website. It's also on Amazon. Uh, and so it uh, talks about our approach to using food as medicine and uh, yeah. gets into some of the theory that recipes there as well. Yeah. And, and, you know, we, and when we get back to it, you took an oath in medical school, the Hippocratic Oath, and that's what it said, let food be thy medicine. And you're getting back to what you really were supposed to learn in medical school. You know? well, yeah, Hippocrates is, is uh, credited for that quote and uh, in our oath he said, do no harm. And so, you know, getting people on natural food is the best way to do no harm. Right. So. But instead of the Hippocratic Oath, from now on, we're all going to take, all us listeners, the Montgomery Oath, which is eat like a rabbit and train sure. like an athlete. Well, what there a great so, Such a pleasure talking to you. I look forward to seeing you in February, maybe playing poker if there's time. We can maybe take <laughs> Dr. Greger down, you know, or something. He seems like he'd be a really fun poker player. I'll be interviewing him at the end of this month. And thank you all so much for listening to Healthy Living. I'm Chef AJ. And I make healthy taste delicious. Good night, everyone, and thank you, Dr. Montgomery. Thank you, Chef AJ. I'll see you, I'll see you in a few weeks. See you soon. Thank you. Take care. Thanks. Bye.